Good to have you join us today. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Lee Ji-yoon in Seoul. We have a lot lined up for you today, so let's first get started with a look at the day's highlights. Massive capital outflows. Foreign investors are continuing to sell heavy, with Korea recording the biggest losses among major Asian emerging markets. Korea is enjoying higher credit ratings assigned by the world's top credit agencies. How did this upgrade come about, and is it too early to celebrate? We we'll sit down with an expert. Is it going to be a hike or no hike? That's the question that the U.S. Federal Reserve will have to answer now, as discussions are ongoing over there on whether or not it's going to raise interest rates for the first time since 2006. Our Son Jung-in tells us more. The U.S. Central Bank's Rate Setting Committee has kicked off its much-awaited September meeting. During the two-day affair, the 12 members of the Federal Open Markets Committee will discuss whether to raise interest rates for the first time in more than nine years. Global economists are evenly split on the pivotal decision after some conflicting signals from the latest economic data. On the plus side, the country's job growth has been improving. The U.S. unemployment rate fell to 5.1 percent in August, a level the Fed sees as likely to boost both wages and inflation. On the other hand, consumer prices took an unexpected tumble in August. The U.S. Labor Department said Wednesday that its consumer price index, a key measure of inflation, slipped 0.1 percent from July after having risen in the previous seven months. Another inflation measure, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, was up just 0.3 percent in July from a year ago. This is why some economists believe the Fed will hold off on a rate hike until later this year. The inflation target is around 2 percent over the next two or three years. That forecast is not there. There is no need to rush to do it. Korea is among the countries eagerly awaiting the outcome of the meeting. Local officials have projected that if Korea's lending interest rate increases 0.25 percentage points, assuming the Fed raises its rates, it would result in an annual loan interest income of 1.5 billion U.S. dollars. The committee's decision will be announced on Friday at 3 a.m. Korea time. Fed Chair Janet Yellen is expected to hold a press conference shortly afterward to explain the reasons behind the move. Son Jung-in, Business Daily. With the ongoing uncertainty in the global economy, more and more foreign investors are pulling their money out of major emerging markets. And Korea saw the biggest losses in recent weeks. Our Kwon Soa tells us more. The stock market volatility caused by the China risk, the possibility of a U.S. rate hike and the weak global economy are threatening emerging countries, which have seen foreigners pull assets from their equity markets in recent weeks. According to the Korea Center for International Finance, Korea saw the biggest losses among major Asian emerging markets, with more than 5.2 billion U.S. dollars pulled from its stock market in a span of two months. India saw a loss of almost $3.3 billion in the same period, followed by Thailand and Taiwan. In the past four weeks alone, the capital outflow in Korea amounted to almost $3.9 billion. Foreign investors in Korea continued their heavy selling streak for a 29th straight session on Korea's main benchmark Kospi from early August through Tuesday. It was the second longest one in history. The total market capitalization held by foreign shareholders also dropped to the lowest level so far this year, standing at a little under 31.9 percent, a two percentage point drop from the end of last year. However, with offshore investors back on a buying position to pick up local stocks, analysts say Korea will see a much faster influx of cash than others, as the country's economic fundamentals remain stronger than other developing countries, especially as Korea's credit rating was recently bumped up a notch by major global agencies. Kwon Soa, Business Daily. Despite increased concerns about a global economic slowdown, one of the world's top credit agencies, Standard & Poor's, upgraded Korea's credit rating to its highest level in nearly 18 years. 
Now, there are growing hopes that this will help Korea secure its spot as a more stable market for foreign investors. Take a look. Standard & Poor's has pushed Korea's sovereign credit rating up a notch this week to double A minus from A plus, citing stronger growth potential in the next three to five years. Korea holds a double A minus from Fitch and double A three by Moody's, equivalent to SNP's double A minus. With this, Korea has now joined the ranks of the U.S., Germany, Canada, Britain, France, and Saudi Arabia in getting a double A minus equivalent or higher from the top three global credit agencies. This latest upward adjustment also puts Korea's average rating higher than that of China and Japan. Following news of this latest upgrade, the Korean won stayed at its highest level against the U.S. dollar on Thursday since mid-August. There are now growing hopes that higher credit ratings for Asia's fourth largest economy will have a positive effect on foreign investor sentiment at a time when capital outflow has been picking up. And to tell us more about this, we're now joined by Professor Kim Se-won of Ihua Women's University. So good to have you join us today. Good afternoon, Gio. All right, so before we get started, can you briefly tell us what mm -hmm. exactly these credit ratings mean mm -hmm. to a country and how do these credit agencies mm -hmm. assign them? Yes, uh, uh, the three major uh, rating companies independently evaluate the financial credibility of different countries based on very broad uh, economic information. Mm -hmm. But technically speaking, uh, they evaluate the bonds uh, issued by government. So they evaluate the possibility of the bankruptcies of these bonds. But, and, and in addition, it is an important yardstick for international investors to, de to decide on investment in foreign countries. All right, then, like we saw in the report, this mm -hmm. is a big thing for Korea because yes. Korea is only one of eight G20 countries that mm -hmm. have received a double A minus or equivalent mm -hmm. or higher. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some other reasons behind this latest upgrade? Well, this time actually, SMP pointed out three uh, major reasons of upgrading. Mm -hmm. uh, the three reasons are, as we all know, the robust economic growth in the past, uh, which is a uh, stronger economic growth compared to other major economies. And second reason is uh, uh, the, the Korean government physical soundness. That means that Korean government has less burden from uh, its own debt, uh, which is 40% against the GDP. But in the case of the United States, it is 80% against the GDP. And in the kind of Japanese uh, government, it is almost 200%. Mm. So we have less burden of the government debt. The last reason pointed out by SMP is uh, Korea's international indebtedness. So internationally, our uh, credit, is credit is bigger than our debt. So we are uh, net uh, creditors. So that gave uh, more point on uh, credit uh, improvements. All right, what about North Korea? Because we have relaxed tensions from... Yes, that's uh, a good point, actually. Okay. Uh, this time, we have a, a dramatic agreements between two Koreas. And, and SMP has been really conservative in, in upgrading mm -hmm. our uh, uh, credit rating because of the threat from North Korea. But this time, that uh, agreement really helped out to lessen the burden from the military, uh, mil mil military situation. Okay. Well, then now we want to know, how does this current ratings for Korea compare mm -hmm. to, I guess, its previous ones? Mm -hmm. I mean, we did, with yes, this day, it's yes, the highest yes. one in 18 uh, years actually, from SMP. Uh, the, the regular based uh, uh, sovereign uh, credit rating has been started in the early 1990s. Okay. But, but, but we have a great history of the credit rating before uh, 1997's financial crisis at the level of double A, which is as good as Australia and Sweden. But at the peak of the uh, crisis, our uh, cred credit rating has been degraded down to uh, triple B level. This is almost junk bond level. Mm. So, for example, uh, public investors are not allowed to buy junk bonds. But after that, we recovered a uh, step by step, like once in two years or once in three years, up to uh, uh, A plus level in 2013. Then this time we have uh, even higher uh, rating of the uh, double A level. Well, obviously, this is good news for Korea, yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. the Korean economy as a whole, then. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So thanks to this kind of sovereign uh, uh, rating improvements, our companies will be benefited with this kind of uh, higher ratings. Because, for example, Korean banks or uh, companies are borrowing money from abroad. They will pay less interest 
thanks to improvements. All right, then. Now, all eyes are on the U.S. Fed Reserve, whether mm -hmm. it's going to raise yes. its interest rate or not. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that's going to, whatever decision that comes out from there, do you think that's going to have an impact on well, the cre Korea's credit ratings? Well, I don't think so, actually. Personally, really? I think okay. that as, as far as we maintain our robust economic growth, uh, sound uh, fiscal status and, and indebtedness, uh, we, our credit rating will be uh, further improved, I think. So, so, so possible possibility of the hiking interest rate from the U.S. Fed has been already reflected in Korean economy. So, I don't think that rating will be Korean rating will be affected by a U.S. Fed decision. All right. So, you think it's a separate issue, kind of? Exactly. All right. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you very Professor. much. Now, there's a new kid in town in Korea's rental housing world. The so-called New Stay Corporate Housing Projects are brand new apartments built to rent under special guidelines with the renter in mind. At the groundbreaking ceremony in the port city of Incheon on Thursday, President Park Geun-hye explained that tenants will be guaranteed a lease period of eight years with annual rent hikes to never exceed 5%. The first development with its 2,205 units has already been filled with the move-in date of February 2018. Now, they're described as competitive complexes offering custodial, childcare and gym services, among others. And President Buck hope expressed hope that the new state project will revolutionize middle-class housing, prompting other property owners to follow suit with cheaper rental prices. The Seoul government is planning more than 60,000 such corporate rental homes by the year 2017. Korea's free trade deals have helped prop up shrinking exports and imports in the first half of this year. Korea Customs Service said transactions with free trade partners contracted 6.6% on-year, while the value with non-FTA partners dropped by nearly double at 13%. Trade with FTA countries is taking up a higher proportion of Korea's overall foreign commerce. 44% of the country's total trade comes from partners with free trade pacts in place, up threefold from five years ago. The total trade value of Asia's fourth largest economy dipped around 10% on year in the January to June period, logging 491 billion U.S. dollars. Accounting fraud is a serious white-collar crime that can have large implications for many investors. But under current Korean laws, the maximum penalty that can be imposed, no matter the degree of damage, is much lower than $2 million. Some call it prefer preferential treatment for conglomerates, and financial regulators are zoning in on the problem. Our Eunice Kim has this report. Daewoo Engineering and Construction has been mired in allegations of cooking its books to the tune of $170 million. But as investigations continue, its maximum penalty is more or less already determined. It's $1.7 million. That's right, about 1% of the total scheme, or the cost of two apartment units the builder constructs. That's the ceiling, stipulated under Article 429 of Korea's Capital Markets Act, a guideline that has not been touched since 2001 when the limit was last raised. Unlike the slap on the wrist, other countries like the U.S., U.K. and Japan are coming down hard on companies found guilty of accounting fraud. In a recent shock and awe revelation, Toshiba admitted to overstating profits by at least $1.2 billion. Reuters reported the Japanese conglomerate is expected to face charges of more than double its violation, upwards of $3.2 billion. Korea's top financial regulator had submitted plans to revise fines, but did not include a proposition to update the fine limit. A large number of people fall victim, so it's considered a huge crime. The punishment needs to no doubt be strengthened. But the Financial Services Commission did show a change in attitude when it was questioned on it again in a recent audit at the National Assembly. 
A lot of companies seem to not care since the fine is limited. That seems to be the prevailing sentiment. As you've pointed out, our punitive measures are too weak. We need to strengthen them so they reflect our commitment to rooting out accounting fraud. Eyes are on whether this stance will translate into action this time around. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. And that wraps it up for today. Thanks so much for staying with us throughout our program. We'll be back with more tomorrow at the same time, same place. Until then, goodbye.